All right, take your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And uh, we got a lot of ground to cover tonight. And uh, we will do our best to get through the whole thing. And, um, but we're, just so you know, we're really, um, <laughs> we're really kind of doing an overview the last three weeks. Um, we haven't been able to go into as much detail because um, a lot of these passages, you could spend two or three weeks just on one passage of prophecy. So, um, but we are going to try to put some things together tonight. We're going to look at the seven years of retribution or judgment. Um, you know, people are curious about the end of the world. And um, you talk to a lot of people and said, I don't like reading that book of Revelation and, um, because it's scary. And it is. It's terrifying. And we're going to see some of that tonight. But if you look at Matthew chapter 24 by way of introduction, this is right after Jesus left the temple. It's the last time he was in the temple before his crucifixion. And basically said that Israel was so to speak, Ichabod, the glory had departed from Israel because of their rejection. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 24, it says, Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the hope that you give us in Christ Jesus. We're thankful for salvation. But Lord, we do pray, even tonight, as we look at this horrible time, just seven years, but seven years of travesty, seven years of destruction, seven years of judgment. And Lord, we pray that there's some here tonight that do not know you as Savior, that they would trust you, put their faith in Christ Jesus to be saved so that they will be spared from this hour of temptation that the whole world will face. And I pray you'd speak to our hearts and challenge us, and we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we look at this, there's three basic truths we want to look at tonight regarding this period that we sometimes call the tribulation. That's the first thing we want to look at, the period of the tribulation. Now, Jesus is talking about this in Matthew 24, and he's giving this prophecy to the Jewish people. That's the first thing you have to keep in mind. And um, there's a lot of confusion about Matthew 24, and when you try to fit the church in there, you get in a whole lot of trouble. This is not about the church. This is about the tribulation period leading into the second coming. Now, in this period we have several descriptions of this seven-year period, okay? The Bible has different descriptions, and of course, the first one I want to look at is the 70th week of Daniel. Now, in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, we have mentioned this several times already, but in verse 24, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon the people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, as you look at this, this is, this is something that was given to Israel and to Jerusalem. So it's these two facets that it's related to. The church, as we said weeks gone by, it's not in there, okay? Look at verse 25, though. It says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince 
shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, if we can put up that first chart. This is going to give you the breakdown of the 70-week prophecy. Now, it's, if you have not studied this before, it can be very complicated. I'm going to try to simplify it as much as I can. Um, but it's divided really into three parts, okay? First of all, it says that this prophecy begins when the decree will go forth for the rebuilding of the streets and the walls of Jerusalem, not the temple. Now, during Ezra's time, the temple was rebuilt. And, but this is not the same time period. This time period begins with Nehemiah's time. So that would be, and that's why we have this date right here, 444 B.C., because that's when that decree was made by, I believe, Xerxes, and he gave Nehemiah permission to go back rebuild the walls, rebuild the streets, and so forth. So that's when this prophecy begins. Now this prophecy is based upon this term weeks. And that term week, as we said last week, means is the Greek or the Hebrew word Shabuah. And, and it basically means um, a set of seven. And the set of seven, it's like our word dozen. You use it, and it is in reference to sevens. Of course, obviously, a week is how many days? Seven. It's a set of seven. God worked in sets of seven. Every uh, seven, or every 49 years, which is seven times seven years, the, the 50th year was the year of Jubilee. There were different markings. Every seventh year was a Sabbath year, and they were to let the land rest for that year. So that's the context, if you read the first part of chapter 9, Daniel discovers this. We mentioned that last week. The reason that's important is because the weeks, the set of sevens, there's 70 sets of sevens, and they are in the units of years. So each week is seven years. So when you take the total of 70 times seven years, that equals 490 years. So this prophecy relates to a period of 490 years. The first section of the prophecy is broken into two parts. You have seven weeks or 49 years plus 62 weeks. And after that second unit of measure, which would total 69 weeks, it leads to Christ's death. That's why it says there, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Why did Christ go to the cross? For us. He died on the cross for us. It wasn't for him. He wasn't, he wasn't a criminal. He died for the criminals. So we have that. Now, that is 69 of the 70 weeks. That means there's one set of seven years left. Okay? But in between that 69th and 70th week, God stops the prophecy clock for Israel. And partly that's because of their rejection of their Messiah. God puts them aside for a period of time, which at this time is what we call the church age. And that's that gap. That's the gap that we talked about the first week that the Old Testament prophets didn't see. 
That's the gap that we're looking at. Now, when that rapture of the church takes place, and we don't know when that is, hopefully soon, sooner than later, but when that rapture takes place, then God will finish that 70th week, which is the tribulation period, okay? So that's why it's called uh, the 70th week of Daniel, the other term that's used is Jacob's trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, for he shall be saved out of it. So it's a time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, obviously, is in reference to the nation of Israel. Thirdly, it's referred to in Revelation 3.10 as the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, in, in 3.10, it tells us the church is spared from that time period. In other words, we are not going through that hour of temptation or what we would call Jacob's trouble or the next verse the tribulation. Now Matthew 24, 29 says this, immediately after the tribulation of those days, this, that statement in context, all the things that happened before verse 29 in Matthew 24 is describing that tribulation period in the context of Israel. If you notice there, he gives several warnings, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. But that tribulation period is right before the second coming. So it's between the time of the rapture and the second coming of Christ. And that's important to keep it there. Now, the third or the fourth or fifth uh, description is the wrath to come, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and to wait for his son from heaven whom he hath raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Because of our salvation, we're delivered from that time of wrath here on the earth. It's also referred to as the wrath in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, where it says, for God hath not appointed us to wrath. So that time period then is several names that are describing this period of seven years. Now you say, wow, that's a lot of focus on just seven years. Well, um, let's look at this. First of all, let's look at not only the descriptions of the period, but let's look at the divisions of this period, the divisions of the period. As we said, the seven years is divided in half thus indicating that the last three and a half years is called the Great Tribulation. Now, a lot of people refer to the whole tribulation as the Great Tribulation, but that's not the way the Bible defines it. You have the first three and a half years, which is the tribulation, then at the midpoint they go into what's called Great Tribulation. Matthew 24, 21 says, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to the time, no, nor ever shall be. Now, why the division of the seven years? Let's, we have another chart. Let's put this second chart up here, okay? We kind of broke it down, the seven-year tribulation, into the first half and the second half, okay? And um, on the first half, you will see several things listed there that will take place. Treaty made with many, including Israel, by the Antichrist. That's from, Reve that's from Daniel 9, 27. Uh, the temple will be rebuilt in Israel. And um, there will be a false peace that seems to come over um, the world at this point. There will be a beast and a false prophet that will rise to power um, there will be the beginning of the seal, the trumpet judgments that begin. The great apostasy explodes at that time and war against Israel. Some think that that might be Ezekiel either 38 or chapter 39. Um, 
but that's the division. Now, why, why three and a half years? What else takes place here? Well, why is the second half called great tribulation? Well, there's three reasons. First, the fulfillment of prophecy in Daniel 9.27, which we just read a moment ago, that in the midst of the week, the Antichrist will break this treaty and he will go into the temple. And we'll talk about that in a second. But So the Antichrist breaks the treaty made with Israel. That's been foretold of the division and Christ warned Israel of this moment. In Matthew 24, 15, he says this, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. And then he goes on to describe what Israel's to do. He says, flee to the mountains. Get out of Jerusalem. Don't go down and pack your bags, just leave. Get out. Pray it's not on the Sabbath day. Well, would that have any significance to the church? The Sabbath day. Do we practice the Sabbath day, folks? No. When do we worship? Sunday, the first day of the week. Why? Because that's when Jesus rose from the dead. Saturday is the Sabbath. That's Jewish, not Christian. And so he says, pray it's not on the Sabbath. Why, is it, why does he pray it's not on the Sabbath? Because in Jerusalem, you can't even get a taxi. You can't even get a donkey on the Sabbath day. From 6 p.m. Sunday or Friday night to 6 p.m. Saturday night, there's no public transportation. There's no flights in and out of Israel. You can't get anywhere. So that's the warning here at this midpoint. When you see the abomination and desolation, go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll probably come to this later on, but since we're here, we'll just talk about it now. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it talks about the man of sin and the son or the son of perdition. If you look at verse 4, let me get the right chapter here. Okay, here we go. It says, um, in the middle of verse 3, it says, For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of permission. The man of sin, or the son of perdition, is in reference to the Antichrist. Listen to what he does. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, where is God's temple on earth? Jerusalem, yeah, the Temple Mount. And in the middle of that tribulation period, he's going to come in, he's going to stop the oblations, he's going to stop the sacrifices from the, the re, rebirth of the priesthood and the, the uh, sacrificial system for Israel. That's what Israel's looking for. They're getting ready to build that third temple, Okay, and that third temple, I talked. We talked to a man when we were there in Israel back in May of uh, last year, and we said, "How long would it take them to build the temple once they got the permission in the land? Three months. Three months. It can go up fast. So that will happen very quickly. And in that time period, Israel will feel like, wow." You know, we are, you know, we are here and um, we're waiting now for the coming of our Messiah while the Antichrist in the midpoint of the tribulation, that's when he will come in and the reason he'll stop the sacrifices is because he's going to claim that he is God. He is their Messiah. Now, that's, that's the first thing. Secondly... At the same time, there's a war in heaven with Satan and his angels versus Michael and God's angels. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. 
He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And then verse 12, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to, of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Revelation 13, 5 says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things, speaking of the Antichrist, and blasphemings, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. That's three and a half years. That's the last half of the tribulation. Now, <clears throat> so this ties in with a couple of things. In the, at the very, almost the midpoint probably, or sometime in that first three and a half years, the Antichrist will be assassinated or will be killed with a sword, it says. But he will be revived, or it appears to be a resurrection. And, um, and I believe that's when Satan, who is cast now down to the earth, and he can't, he can't leave the earth, God's restricted him to the earth, he's going to possess the body of the Antichrist. And um, here's a little thought. This is kind of wild, but uh, there's only one other man in the Bible who's called the son of perdition. Do you know who that is? Judas Iscariot. And it's interesting because when it describes the coming of the Antichrist, it says he was, this is in Revelation 17, he is not, and he will descend out of the bottomless pit. And Judas, when he died, it says he went to his own place, which could have been the bottomless pit. So it could be the soul of Judas who will also co-inhabit the body of the Antichrist. And you say, why? Well, he was with Jesus three and a half years. He would know how to imitate Jesus from a human standpoint. Now, I don't know if that's, that's just my theory, but... Um, you can run with it, whatever you want to do, or you can just throw it out. Third thing is the Antichrist's new focus. Now, in chapter 13 of Revelation, verse 3, it says, And I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Now, if you look at chapter 12 and verse 9, it tells us who the dragon is. Who is it? Satan. It's the devil. It's the old serpent, okay? And so the dragon or, or Satan will give the power to the Antichrist. And it says, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? The Antichrist will be killed. As we said, he will be repossessed by Satan, and then his whole focus will be self-proclaimed deity. And those especially who will not bow down to him, he will kill. And of course, he will go after, if you read the whole chapter 12 of Revelation, he goes after Israel. That's what it says, God says, told them to flee, they flee into the wilderness. And God will take care of them in that wilderness. But Satan's going after them. So the Antichrist, thirdly, proclaims to be God. And we just read that in 2 Thessalonians, where he exalts himself. And um, that word opposeth there in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3, or verse 4, who opposes and exalted himself, that word opposeth means to set over against or opposite, to oppose so he's opposing the true and living God and impersonating and pretending that he is God. In other words, a counterfeit God. And as I said, at this point, Satan unleashes his torment and his persecution against Israel and any Gentile believers for that matter. If you read on in chapter 13, anybody who doesn't take the mark of the beast or his name um, will not be able to buy or sell. 
He'll have control of the economics, he'll have control of the politics, and he'll have control of the world religions. And um, that's your one world ruler, which our world is very fastly heading towards. Now, we see the period of the tribulation. Let's see the progression of the tribulation. This seven-year period will begin with great calamity, the rapture. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, this is right after he's given comfort to the church, to the believers, and saying, hey, comfort one another with these words because you're going to be raptured out. But then in verse 2 of chapter 5, he says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. It will come suddenly. In fact, it says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And so God tells us the true church will not be present during this horrible time, but that, that rapture, that catching away, think of the turmoil and the chaos that's gonna cause. I mean, millions of people just disappear. And then the results, I mean, if you're driving down the 405 and you're doing 70 miles an hour and the rapture comes, that car doesn't have a driver. Whoa. Think about if there's airplane pilots. If they're saved and they're raptured out, who's going to fly the plane? So better make sure you're saved before you take another flight because <laughs> if the rapture comes, you may have to fly the plane if you're not saved. So, But I believe at that time period, Satan will take advantage of that. I believe this might be where the Antichrist will rise to power. Um, the popular Bible prophecy workbook, Tim LaHaye and Ed Hinson wrote, they said on page 73, they said, the spiritual vacuum left by the disappearance of millions of Christians will also enable the Antichrist to further his plan for a forced one world religion and government. In other words, he, they will take chaos and they will use it to take control. By the way, that's right out of the Communist Manifesto, by the way, if you've ever read it. Now, <clears throat> here's the explanation. You know, they're going to have to somehow explain the disappearance of all these people. I mean, how do they explain that? And the Antichrist is going to come up with some kind of an explanation. I think it'll be... Um, we have all these wise people that want to come to the earth and give you wisdom and cures for diseases and all these things. But we couldn't do it because there's a negative power here that's holding them back. But now that those troublemakers have been removed, so now we can bring in our one world government and we aren't going to have Christians and all these people trying to hinder us. I can see that explanation very easily. So let's look here at the deception of Satan. Um, we see it in Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. It says, And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast. Verse 6, And he opened his mouth in blaspheming against God, to blaspheming his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. So he's going to turn totally against God, which he's already been totally against God. Secondly there, destruction by God's judgment. Now, the specific judgments that will be poured out on the earth during the tribulation, these are described in the book of Revelation. Seven sealed judgments, the seven trumpet judgments, the seven thunder judgments, the seven vile judgments. Now, we don't have time to go through all those, but we are going to touch on a few. And um, each one of those, when you come to the end of those judgments, it brings you through the tribulation up to the very point of when the second coming would take place. And then it's kind of like playing a piano piece. You, you build up a crescendo, and then you get to the top, and you decrescendo, and you start over and build up again. That's what's going on in the book of Revelation. 
So you're getting these different perspectives of the tribulation. Most of you have probably watched a football game or something where they have a replay of the, game, of the play, something that was maybe a good catch or it was a, a tackle or whatever or something, and you'll see the instant replay of that, but it's not always the same angle. It's the same play, but you see it from different angles, different um, from sometimes you'll see it from the, you know, from the, uh, um, the, the line right there at the, at the goal line. Sometimes you'll see it, they'll zero in on an individual. Sometimes um, you'll see them run the pattern and, and see the catch. They'll, they'll run it all different angles, but it's the same play. And that's what's going on in the book of Revelation. It's giving us all these different views and different perspectives of what's going on in the tribulation. It's similar to the four gospels. And when you read the four gospels, you get four different perspectives of Jesus Christ. In Matthew, you see him as the king. In Mark, you see him as the servant. In Luke, you see him as the son of man. And in John, you see him as the son of God. Well, when you look at these judgments in the book of Revelation, you're seeing the different viewpoints of the tribulation. Now, <clears throat> so the judgments can fall into some different categories. First of all, life ending judgments. There are going to be judgments that are going to be self imposed by man himself. There's going to be wars, as it says, wars, rumors of wars. You say, well, we have that now. Yeah, but it will intensify. Um, <clears throat> It says there in, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 3, it says, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat up thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So there will be battle. There will be war in the tribulation. Then he mentions Famine. Usually after war, often there's famine because of the destruction of materials and supplies, food, food um, uh, reserves, and so forth. Verse 5 of chapter 6 of Revelation, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. A penny or a denarius was a Roman soldier's day's wage. So a, a Roman soldier's day's wage would be a measure of wheat or three measures of barley or whatever a denarius would count. So his whole day's wage just to buy enough to make a loaf of bread. In other words, supply and demand, and the supplies will be short. We found that out during COVID, didn't we? How quickly shortages can come up. If you remember walking into some of the supermarkets and so forth, and, and looking in the meat counter, or looking in the, you know, in the uh, toilet paper counters, but it, it'll be very much, serious, much, much more serious than that. There will be famine. And then, of course, um, pestilences. Pestilence means a pest or plague. This, um, would, this would place um, diseases, epidemics, beasts, or insect attacks in this category. Diseases and plagues often follow war, contaminated water supplies, dead bodies not properly disposed of and buried, um, during the Dark Ages in Europe, the bubonic plague killed one-third of Europe's people in the 14th century. So it can happen again, and it has happened. We've had AIDS epidemic in Africa. We've had the Ebola um, outbreak, SARS, swine flu, and many others, and of course, COVID-19. And don't think there won't be other things that God can bring upon this world as well, and man bring on himself. So we have life-ending judgments. 
we have environmental devastations. Um, when you look at the trumpet judgments, it talks about earthquakes in diverse places, and all these are the beginning of sorrows, it says in Matthew 24. Um, but earthquakes, Science News shared in 2009 that by 2004, Sumatra, the Sumatran earthquake or quake, the largest quakes can weaken fault zones worldwide. And of course, the Bible says there will be earthquakes in diverse places. In fact, Revelation mentions an earthquake at the end of the tribulation so powerful that it will divide the city of Jerusalem and thousands will be killed. Um, fires. A third of the trees will be burned up according to Revelation 8, 7. And all grass, this will create oxygen problems. This will create breathing problems. Think about the Paradise Fire that took place in Northern California a few years ago that wiped out an entire town and thousands and hundreds of thousands of acres. Can you imagine that being worldwide? And then Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, it says, and, and when you read that, it talks about a mountain coming down and crashing into the Mediterranean Sea. I think it might be some type of a meteorite that will hit the Mediterranean Sea, destroying a third of the animal life and ships, and destroyed, no doubt, from the meteor itself that would probably create a tidal wave and will also, perhaps, because of the velocity, if it hits right, could open up the earth and create a volcano that would explode, and of course, that would cause great um, death in that region as well. Water contamination. Revelation 8, verses 10 through 11, it talks about fresh water supplies poisoned, and many men will die by that. And it talks about wormwood poisoning the waters, poisoning the fresh waters. Could be also fallout from perhaps bombing or who knows, warfare, so on. Letter E there, the loss of, sun, of the sun's power. The loss of the sun's power. The earth will lose one third of the sun's power of light and heat. That's Revelation 8, 12. Doesn't indicate for how long. Now, when you think about all this, you think, man, the whole world's just going to blow up. Well, it's not going to blow up. It's going to be purged. It's going to be a lot of destruction. But remember, Jesus is going to come back and is going to turn it into a paradise for a thousand years. So regardless of what, you know, the environmentalists are telling you, the earth is pretty durable. Now, so you have life-ending judgments, you have environmental devastation, you have specific judgment specifically for the beast's kingdom. I believe the, the vile judgments will be in the last three and a half years um, or part of the last three and a half years and those vile judgments will be tied in with the two witnesses that come to preach and to stand against the Antichrist who's trying to kill Israel and destroy Israel. Now, I know there's a lot of discussion, and we don't have time to get into all the reasons, but I believe those two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. Moses, because he represents the law to Israel. Elijah, who represents the prophets. The law and the prophets is what Christ preached after his resurrection. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus about himself. And so those two witnesses will be there and the other reason is, is because of what they'll do. In Revelation eleven six, 6, it says, these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. How many, how long, when Elijah was in the Old Testament, how long did it not rain? Three years and six months, or 42 months, or three and a half years. Think about that. Their ministry is in the last three and a half years it's very possible there will be no rain in the kingdom of the Antichrist or even throughout the entire earth for three and a half years. And then it says, 
and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Well, who, who turned the water to blood and smote the earth with plagues? Moses. Now, these are called the woes. When you get to the last three judgments of the trumpet judgments, they're also called woes. Um, the fifth trumpet, you have the locusts from hell. That's what I call them because they come out of the pit. They're in the form of locusts, but they have a sting like a scorpion, and they torment men who took the mark of the beast for five months, but they can't die from it. They're just tormented with it. Then they get sores that develop on them that took the mark of the beast. A grievous sore, an outbreak of some kind of a sore. Some think it might be leprosy, it might be boils. I don't know whatever it is, but it's a grievous sore. And it breaks out on those who took the mark of the beast. So this is all directed straight at Satan and the Antichrist. Now this one, hopefully you didn't eat supper before you came. The Mediterranean and the fresh water supplies are turned to literal blood. In chapter 16 of Revelation, it speaks about the, 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 the Mediterranean Sea turning into dead man's blood, or the blood of a dead man. If you think about a dead man, when he dies, his blood coagulates. It doesn't continue to run, it, it begins to harden up. Can you imagine the whole Mediterranean Sea being dead man's blood? say, well, that sounds like science fiction. Where do you think science fiction gets its ideas? From the Word of God. I mean, that's, that's horrific. And everybody thinks, oh, we're going through the tribulation right now. This is a Sunday school picnic compared to what the tribulation is going to bring. Um, and then in chapter 16, verses 13, 14, and 16, it talks about the three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. That is Armageddon. That is when all the nations will come against Christ. And of course, it won't be much of a battle. Christ will wipe them out with the word of his mouth. So we see the period, we see the, prog the progression. Finally, let's look at the purpose. What is the purpose of the tribulation? There's two purposes, basically. The first purpose relates to Israel, and it involves several aspects. Number one, to release Israel from Gentile control. That's what the, the time of Jacob's trouble is all about. And in verse eight of, of Jeremiah 30, it says, it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds, and tr strangers shall no more serve themselves of him but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king whom I will raise up unto them. So part of the purpose of the tribulation is to break the, the bondage that Israel is under by the Gentile nations. Secondly, it's to refine Israel. God always has a purpose and a product in trials. In Zechariah 13, verse eight and nine, it says, and it came to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. That's, full, that's gonna be fulfilled prophecy. That's promised to Israel. And 
Part of the tribulation is to refine Israel, to bring them to faith. And then, of course, the third thing is to redeem Israel. Romans eleven twenty six 26 says, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. God promised he would save Israel as a nation. And that will happen at the end of the tribulation. That's what the whole purpose of that final week of the 70 weeks is for, is to bring Israel to Christ, to salvation. Isaiah 59, verses 19 and 20, you don't have time to read that, but it talks again about um, the, the, the redeeming of Israel and Zion, Zion referring to uh, Jerusalem. So the first purpose relates to Israel. It's to bring them to salvation. And by the way, sometimes trials is what brings people to salvation. Then the second purpose as it relates to the nations. LaHaye says again in his um, Are We Living in the End Times, he says, quote, we believe with all our hearts that the tribulation judgments of God serve a dual purpose, to punish hardened sinners and to move others to repentance and faith. The tribulation will be God's ultimate illustration of the truth found in Romans 11:22. Behold, therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. So it will be a time of judgment on these nations. It will be, number one, a retribution to the nations. And we don't, we don't take the time, but read Psalm 2 tonight and, and read about how the heathen rage and the people imagine these vain things and the kings of the earth set themselves against God and, and the Son of God. And in verse 5 it says, then he shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. The world has rejected God's truth, and in particular, the free gift of salvation. And the consequences of that is judgment. Um, and then the, th the th second thing is this, repentance of the people. Retribution of the nations, but repentance of the people. There will be, I believe, many, many people saved in the tribulation. And um, Revelation 9, verses 20 and 21, it says, And the rest of men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Now, you say, well, wait a minute, that says they didn't repent. That, that implies then that God provided these judgments for people to repent. And it's going to take some serious things to really stir people up at that point because their hearts will be so hardened. Sometimes we think that God gets a bad rap. When people focus exclusively on the judgments and terrors to come, they see the Lord as some kind of angry monster heaping up cat catastrophes and pouring them on the heads of defenseless, innocent men and women. But this is all wrong. First, those who suffer the judgments of God in the tribulation are not innocent men and women. Remember, we're all born sinners. We're rebels at heart. The, the rebels alive at that time will not only reject God and his offer of salvation, but will run greedily toward every vile sin known to man, including blaspheming of a kind beyond description. And second, despite their gross sin, God intends that these tribulation judgments might lead even these wicked sinners to faith in his son, Jesus Christ. So even though there's judgment, in judgment, God's mercy is always there. Whoever wants it. 
Now tonight, first of all, we can praise the Lord. If we're saved, we won't go through that. But there are people who might. You may have friends, neighbors, etc., and they will face those horrendous judgments if the rapture comes and we go up and then the tribulation. And let me say this, if you're here tonight without Jesus Christ, before he say, brings his judgment, his final judgments, he's also the one who said God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we've had almost 2,000 years with an invitation to the world to come to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And so we have choices to make based upon this. I hope you'll take time to give thanks to the Lord, but I also hope that if you have unsaved friends and loved ones, you'll make an effort to try to reach them with the gospel. And if you're not saved tonight, in just a moment, we will have a short invitation. And hopefully, if you don't know Christ, we have folks here that would be glad to sit down and show you how you can accept Christ as your Savior. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we were thankful as we looked last week at the rapture that we will be spared from this horrible judgment that will come upon Israel and come upon the nations that rejected you. And Lord, we realize that it's for salvation and hopefully many, many millions of people, even in the tribulation, will repent and be saved. But if not, they will face an eternity in the lake of fire. Father, I pray if there's those here tonight that do not know you as Savior, I pray that you would speak to their hearts with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. How many of you tonight would say, Brother How, if the rapture came right now, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I would go in the rapture because there was a day in my life where I realized I was a sinner and I received Christ as my Savior. Let me see your hands as a testimony of that. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now, I, I noticed there might have been a few that didn't raise your hand. And I appreciate your honesty. But, you know, if you don't know Christ as your Savior tonight, as we, as the piano plays, there will be some of our men and ladies up here that will be glad to take the Word of God and show you how you can be on your way to heaven. Is there someone here tonight you say, Brother Hauk, I, I don't know. If I died right now, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. Pray for me. I need to get that settled. Anyone like that tonight? Okay. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you need to come tonight, maybe you've got someone you need to pray for that you want to reach before it's too late or you're not saved, feel free to come now as the piano plays.